and should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary with His blood He has saved me with His power He has raised me to God be the glory for the things He has done. So we can sing together this great hymn of the faith to, to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, to Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He had done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, to Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He had done. Great things He has taught us, great things He has done, and great our rejoicing to Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, to Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory. Great things He has done. Well, you've been here long enough to enjoy the humidity and the heat, haven't you? And you've discovered that New Orleans has one or two mosquitoes scattered indiscriminately across the place. And you've noticed that we have one of the more interesting cities in the world in which to drive. You've seen driving techniques you've never seen before, haven't you? And who needs a roller coaster when you have our potholes and dips in the road and things like that? And my goodness, all those professors who think the only class you're taking is their class. And about now is when you're saying, now, Lord, just what have you gotten me into? And the answer is a place where you're going to experience His grace. That's why He called you to a city like New Orleans. So you would learn to live in dependence upon the grace and sufficiency of God. And so that you would see Him knock down those insurmountable barriers one at a time. So that you will come to that point 
where you're not just singing the words to the song that happens to be selected for chapel today. But as you walk, as you live, you can't ever get the thought out of your mind. To God be the glory. Dr. Ken Taylor is going to join me here, lead us in a word of prayer. He teaches missions and loves taking students on mission trips across the world. If you have a desire to go to the world while you're a seminary student and do a mission trip and find out how you can do that and also earn academic credit or talk about a ministry of missions, Dr. Taylor is one of the people who'd love to talk with you about that. Dr. Taylor, would you lead us, please? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we can give you the glory, that we can raise our voices and hearts as loud as we can to praise you. Father, we praise that we pray today for those who cannot raise their voices because they live in a place where to do so would bring great danger. To do so might bring arrest or rejection. We pray that you would bring to them today your comfort, your hope, and the courage to stand for you. We pray for those who can't praise you today because they don't have you in their hearts. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would use us and use so many others to bring them the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Lord, today we pray for Fred Luter. We thank you for him, for what he means to work in this city and all over the United States, Father. We pray that you would bless him today as he leads us. Give him the words you'd have him say. Bless him as he continues to lead his church in being on mission for you. Lord, we do pray for our city that you would let us have our eyes opened to the opportunities and be willing to obey and go to the places you want us to go here and around the world, Father. Lord, we just give you the glory and the honor, for you are worthy of it all. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before you sit down, turn to somebody next to you and just remind them, if it's easy, it can't be glorious. Would you do that? Thank you so very much. We do welcome you to chapel today. We have, uh, I think, at least a couple of special groups we want to recognize today. And one of that is a group of folks who've been working really hard. Now, every summer is a particular demanding time for our operations staff. This summer, they had a really big project that they were involved in, and that was trying to get Cary Hall renovated, completely renovated, and ready for the ladies to move in in time for class. It was an exceedingly difficult thing to do on the very short timeline they had, and they put in lots of blood, sweat, and tears, and we have the, the some of the folks who are involved in that. I see our cleaning ladies back over here and operations staff. If you're with operations, would you please just stand and let us thank you for an incredible summer. And then every place I've ever been in New Orleans when Brother Fred was preaching, we always had some members of Franklin Avenue Baptist Church who had come to support their pastor and pray for their pastor as he preaches. And I'm just wondering, do we have any members of Franklin Avenue Baptist here today? If we do, would you please just stand so your pastor will know you're here? There we go. Thank you. We just can't have seminary without Brother Fred coming to preach in chapel. He is one of our campus favorites. Beyond any shadow of a doubt, we're thrilled that he was able to do for us the spring revival. We're looking forward to that time, and we'll enjoy him for a week uh, come the spring. And my, what a great time that's going to be. But today he has come to share with us a message from God's heart. We always invite Brother Fred to come at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. And it's a way to get us off to a good start and a way to wrap up a wonderful year. Fred Luter was born in the, and raised in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans, a place where not, uh, that's right, isn't it? It's a place that you don't think of when you think of an area conducive to growing a great pastor. But it's amazing the things that God pulls together when he wants to do a work in the lives of his children. And he has truly called and gifted one Fred Luter to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to serve as pastor of Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. If you were to ask me today, Dr. Kelly, what do you think is the healthiest church in the city of New Orleans? I would say it is Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. 
Healthy doesn't mean perfect, and healthy doesn't mean everything they're doing is easy. They faced some incredible obstacles in growing and growing. They had one of the worst locations you could ever imagine. And they haven't moved from that location. They've just made it better by their presence there and their growth and their expansion. They're in the midst right now of a second phase of a master plan, expanding that uh, plant, and God is doing a mighty work. We always like to ask our local pastors how to get to their church. So, Brother Fred, would you please come up here? What are your service times? You've got one that will surprise some of our folks. What are your service times? All you folk who are really spiritual, I mean truly spiritual, uh, we have a 7 a.m. Sunday morning service. They, you got to be real spiritual to get up that 7 a.m. in the morning to come to worship the Lord. But uh, we have about 900 people at 7 o'clock in the morning, and you're welcome to be a part of that service. Our second service is at 10:15 a.m. If you need, if you come to that one, you need to get about a half hour early to get a seat. There are people standing around the walls, chairs down the aisles. We have an overflow room. Uh, just trying to keep everybody but the fire marshal from attending that service, so it's going to be a problem for us. Uh, and then our third service starts at, it starts at 12.15. Now get out at 12. Starts at 12.15, and uh, that's our three services. You're welcome to be a part of any of those services. And, of course, our Wednesday morning, 10 o'clock a.m. Bible study, which you need to be here in chapel, and our 7.30 p.m. Wednesday night Bible study, you all are welcome to be a part of that. And how do they get here? Very easy to get here from New Orleans Seminary. The street right in front of you is Gentilly Boulevard. Make a ride outside of the campus. Go to the red light, second red light, which is Franklin Avenue. Can I take a left there? So you got to make a U-turn, but you want to go Franklin Avenue going south and uh, go down to the 2500 block right across the overpass, and you'll see the building right there on your left-hand side. It will be the place people are flooding to get to. You'll see them gathering as you get in that area. Thank you so Thank much, you, Brother Fred. And I want to encourage you again while you are here at New Orleans. It's a great church if you're looking for a church home, and they would love you. And Brother Fred, do you ever take members of your church who are not African Americans? Yes, sir, all the time. That's right. That's what I thought. If, if you're looking for a church home, it's a wonderful church home, and it's also a great place to visit. If you are interested in being in a healthy, live, growing, dynamic church, if you have any concern about that at all, you just have to visit Franklin Avenue. Even if you minister on the weekends or if you have other responsibilities of the churches, that's one thing I love about that 7 a.m. worship service. It gives us a chance sometimes if you have other Sunday responsibilities to be a part of a church. And I want to tell you, to quote an ancient Hebrew expression, that 7 a.m. service, <laughs> it rocks. Uh, it's really, really something. It's, it's not what you think when you think of a 7 a.m. worship service. I also want to really challenge you. I said this when we first gathered together, but I want you to understand the truthfulness and reality of what I'm saying. One of the reasons why God called you to New Orleans, to seminary, is for you to get comfortable in a multiracial environment and to learn to not think of people in terms of their ethnic or racial background or the color of their skin. God brought you here to train you that it's not African American and Anglo and Hispanic and all of that. We're all God's children, all created by God. Now, one of the ways that you can grow in that area is to be in a church and be in other settings where everybody there isn't just like you. And one of the most important things you're going to learn as you learn to worship and fellowship with our African American, Hispanic, and Asian and other brethren, is that they have the same kinds of concerns that you have. They worship and they love the same God that you love. They talk about the same things that you talk about. And I will tell you, as you're going to see in just a moment, whenever, whenever Brother Fred stands to preach, it is always an exposition of Scripture. Have your Bible ready. Use the back of your worship guide for taking notes. That's what I do every chapel service. And be ready. For this is a man who, when he stands, is going to have us open to a passage of Scripture, and he's going to take us through that passage of Scripture and give us some insights that God has given him in the preaching of the Word. Now let's come together for another time of worship and praise, and then we'll hear Fred Luter. Let's spend a few moments reflecting on the cross. As God's people, we preach on the cross, we sing of the cross, much of the time it's about the power of the cross. Let's reflect on the comfort of the cross today as we sing these hymns together. Oh, less than 
did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would He devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I had done? He upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Down at the cross where my Savior cleansing from sin I cried there to my heart was the blood of pride glory to his name glory to his name glory to message to the world is, come to this fountain so rich and sweet. I wrong verse. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's. Plunge in today, plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to Oh, 
will cling to the old rugged cross. I will cling to the old rugged cross. And exchange it someday for a cross. Make this song a song of gratitude for what the work Christ did at the cross. Ah. Uh-huh. 
Church, amen. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Lombard. Thank you so very, very much for our time of praise and worship in this place. That song that you sung just now, Dr. Ken, remind me of another song that was pretty popular around the time that I had just given my life to the Lord. I'm Jay Crouch, and it says, I don't know why Jesus loves me. I don't know why he cares. I don't know why he would sacrifice his life for me. Particularly not strong when I think about where I come from and the things that I was involved in, the stuff that I used to do and the gangs I used to hang out with, the uh, stuff that I used to get involved in. I think about all that, Dr. Kelly, I say, why, why would he love me? Why would he care? And I like the part that said, but I'm so glad. I'm so glad that he did. Where would I be if Jesus wouldn't have loved me? Where would I be if he didn't care? Dr. Taylor, where would I be if he would not have sacrificed his life? But oh, I'm glad. I'm glad that he did. What greater price that he paid for you and for me. Well, good morning. How is everyone doing today? Good to be in AC. Isn't it good to be in AC? I know it's good to be in AC. Giving obedience to God, my Father, Jesus Christ, who is the Lord and Savior of my life, to Dr. Chuck Kelly, my dear friend and brother, who I really appreciate. I consider him not only a friend, but I consider him a mentor in my life because of all that he has done and for me and the encouragement that he's given me through the years. I have preached more at this seminary since he's been president than any place I've ever preached other than Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. And I thank God for him and for his, uh, his leadership and for what he's done at this school as president. Will you join me in giving your president a great hand for what he's done? He's a great, 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 great man of God. To his lovely wife, Dr. Rhonda Kelly, it's always a joy to see you here also. To all the professors and teachers, to all the support staff that are here today, but particularly to all the students that are from near and from far, we greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want on behalf of one of the local pastors here, Dr. Crosby was here yesterday from First Baptist, but I also want to uh, greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome you to New Orleans, Louisiana. Amen. We are so honored to have you in our city, and we pray God's choices, blessings upon you. And if by chance you do have an opportunity to come and worship with us at Franklin Avenue or to visit with us, it's always a joy to have you to share with us. Keep us in your prayers that God will continue to do the work that he has called us to do. I want to thank God for many of our members who are here today, many of them who are students uh, this semester at the, the seminary campus, and we thank God for all the instruction that they are receiving that they can then bring back and implement at our church there over on the avenue. But I'm also honored and privileged to have with me today, and many of you have never met her before. You may be surprised. She may, be seen, she may have already been sitting next to you in class because she's also taking classes here at the Orleans Seminary. Uh, she's the uh, love of my life, the apple of my eye, my prime rib, my good thing. Amen. I love her to death. My wife, Elizabeth. Will you stand, baby? Amen, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Elizabeth. Amen. Minus the hat this time. Amen. Minus the hat. Turn your Bibles with me this morning to the book of First Peter, chapter 5, as we share in the sermon on today. First Peter... Chapter 5. Why are you here at this campus? Why have you taken the time out and sacrificed careers in business and in law and in nursing and doctoring and attorney? Why, why, why are you here? 
Why are you here to study subjects like Greek and Hebrew? Why are you here to study subjects like the New Testament, the Old Testament, the history of the church? Why are you here? Why have you dedicated your life and the time and the commitment that God has called you into to take time out to come and study and prepare yourselves for what ministry lies ahead of you? Well, let me answer my own question. Many of us are here because we realize that we are in a spiritual warfare here in America. We're in a spiritual battle. We're in a battle for the souls of mankind. And God has called each and every one of you in your own field of ministry, whether it's in music, whether it's in preaching, whether it's in evangelism, whether it's in education. And God has called you to be lights in a dark world and salt in a little sodium saltless society. He's called you to make a difference in the neighborhoods, in the city, in the state where you abide, in the churches that you're a part of. Because the fact of the matter is, every one of us have a common enemy. His name is Satan. And he's trying to do all that he can to steal, kill, and destroy the people of God. But God has called you to be soldiers on the forefront, to stand loud and proclaim the word of God. So that lost men and women, boys and girls, may know that there is a reality in serving a true and a living God. But I've come to warn you today, it won't be easy. Satan will do all that he can to convince you to stop, to convince you to give up, to convince you to throw in the towel. Because the fact of the matter is, he is your enemy. He's our enemy. And he will do all that he can to destroy the people of God and the work of God for moving on to impact the kingdom of God. I want to talk about that this morning from a very familiar passage of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 of that chapter. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 of that chapter. If you have it, please say amen. Matter of fact, you can say amen all throughout the sermon. I don't mind it at all. I'm kind of used to it if you know what I'm talking about. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, you'll find these similar words. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Father and our God, Master, we come this morning in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. And God, as we come, we thank and we praise you for this tremendous opportunity that you've given me once again to stand in this great chapel, to stand behind this sacred desk, and to preach and proclaim your word. Thank you, Lord, for Dr. Kelly. Thank you for his friendship. Thank you for his encouragement. Thank you for the leadership that he has given to this great school. God, we thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice. Bless them collectively and bless them individually. My God, as I ask each and every time I stand to preach your word, God, let me decrease as you increase. Hide me behind the cross. God, let them not be fred, but God, let them see Christ. To the end, God, that you may be glorified. The saints of God may be edified. Satan may be horrified. And we'll be careful to give your name all the praise. The glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And for his sake, and again, let the people of God say amen. amen. I get him anywhere I can, anywhere I can, anywhere I can. <laughs> Dr. Ken, be sober. Lawrence, be vigilant. Pastor Saucer, because your adversary, the devil as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Just for a little while this morning, we want to preach from the subject, exposing the enemy. Exposing the enemy. I tell you, when I was a kid growing up in the lower Nightward area of the city of New Orleans, one of my favorite television programs was Popeye the Sailor Man. How many of y'all remember Popeye the Sailor Man? All right. I used to love me some Popeye. Popeye, you know, very likable fellow. Always in a good mood. Always well man. And Papa would always go out of his way to help somebody. Always whistling. He, he, was, just, he was just a likable fella. He, he was just a, a fella that, that you really like to be around. You really enjoy to be in his presence. Papa had a friend called Whippy. Whippy always loved hamburgers, but he never had any money. He'd always say, I'll pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Sound like some seminary students that y'all know. Popeye also was in love. Popeye was strung out. Popeye's nose was open. Popeye's head was just gone. Popeye was in love with this woman called, I knew you knew it, Oliver. 
Now, personally, I don't see what he saw in Oliver, all right? Dr. Ken's girlfriend didn't do nothing for me. I know there's different strokes for different folks, but, but Oliver, I mean, she didn't do a thing for me. I mean, she, she was, whoop, I mean, just nothing at all, nothing about her. I, I mean, maybe she was a good cook. Maybe she was a good kisser. I don't, I don't know what it was, but Popeye was crazy about Oliver. But believe it or not, Popeye had an adversary. Popeye had an enemy. Popeye even had competition for Oliver. Now figure that one out if you can. Popeye's enemy was a guy by the name of, well, y'all know this, sir, Brutus. Brutus was bigger than Popeye and uglier than Popeye and stronger than Popeye and meaner than Popeye. And the problem is Popeye and Brutus would always get into a fight. And Brutus would be beating up Popeye and maybe breaking his nose and giving him a black eye, breaking his lip, knocking the teeth out of his mouth and me, whipping him from one street of town to another part of town, when all Popeye had to do was eat his, well, y'all know, eat his spinach. And I'd be screaming at the TV, eat your spinach, man, eat your spinach. And Popeye would be getting beat up and beat up. And then Dr. Round suddenly got to a point where Popeye got to a point where he said, that's it. I've taken all I can stand. And I can't stand uh, no more. And Popeye would take his spirituals, his spinach, and he would eat his spinach. And Popeye would get strength that he never had before. He'd get power that he never had before. He'd get uh, a thing that he strength that he never had before. And victorious Popeye would beat up on Brutus every time. He would always end that Saturday morning TV program with a tune that went something like this. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. I'm strong to the finish because I eat all my spinach. I'm Todd Popeye the Sailor Man. Toot, toot. How many of y'all remember that? Remember? Well, my friend, I discovered that many of us are like Popeye before we eat our spiritual spinach. And many of us fall because we don't realize and recognize how to confront the enemy in our lives. I don't know about you, my brothers and my sisters, but I'm tired of hearing about preachers falling. I'm tired of hearing about teachers falling. I'm tired of hearing about believers not being able to stand and be victorious in their walk with the Lord. And many of us, because they don't recognize and realize how to confront our common enemy. Just as Popeye, my brothers and my sisters, exposed the fact that Brutus was his enemy, and Popeye could not deal with Brutus without eating his spinach, I've come today at this seminary campus, at this 10 o'clock chapel service, to expose, to reveal, to make known the enemy of mankind, the enemy of the believer. In this message this morning, my brothers and my sisters, I want you to recognize three things that you must always remember when you're confronted by the enemy. Three things that you must never, ever forget if you're going to be victorious in your walk with the Lord. Three things that every seminary student, every professor, every preacher, every music teacher, every evangelist must understand and never forget if you're going to be victorious in fulfilling the calling that God has on your life. Three things that you must never, ever forget when confronting the enemy in your life. Number one, the first thing you must understand and remember. Remember, first of all, the presence of Satan in this world. The presence of Satan in this world. My brothers and my sisters, just as Popeye had Brutus as his enemy, the believer has Satan as our enemy. However, the only difference is Satan is no cartoon. He, Satan is not someone that go away when you use the remote control and turn channels. Satan is real, and he's on his job 24-7. Our text says, be sober. Avery, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. My friend, Satan is real, and he's present in this world. If you look at how things have changed in America, look at how things have changed in your city and in my city, in your community and my community. My friend, it proves of that Satan is real in this world. Listen, I'm not that old. I'm just 40 something. I'll just leave it like that. If the ladies can do it, brothers, we can do it also. But, but I'm not at all, but Dr. Ron Keller, I can remember not too long ago, I can remember not too long ago when Coke was something that you drank. I can remember that not too long ago when grass was something that you cut with a lawnmower. I can remember not too long ago when pot was something that you cooked in. I can remember not too long ago when, when crack was something that happened to your windshield or your truck when you were driving down I-10 behind an 18-wheeler. I can remember not too long ago when AIDS was a teacher's helper. 
that about the kin I can remember not too long ago when, 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 when a sugar daddy was a caramel candy. That got stuck in the roof of your mouth when you were trying to, ah, ah. But just when it was getting good, and like, ah, 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 ah. But it was a caramel candy that you would love to eat as a kid. I can remember when gay was something you would call when you were just happy. I can remember not too long ago when a strawberry was a dessert that was filled with condensed milk or cream and sugar as a dessert. I can remember not too long ago when dog referred to a four-legged animal. I can remember not too long ago when a scrub was something that you did with a brush cleaning up the room of your house or the floor of the kitchen. I can remember not too long ago when a pigeon was a bird that you fed in city park or an ornament park with popcorn and with bread. And I can remember, now just the you pastors would get this one. I can remember when somebody said, back that thing up. That referred to some of the you pastors got The professor said, what? What did he say? What did he say? Back that what? Back that what? Ask all of you pastors there, I tell you. Um, that, that referred to somebody putting a car in reverse or a truck in reverse. Say, Come on, man, back that thing up, man, back that thing up, back that thing up. But how many know that things are not what they used to be? The enemy has caused changes in our cities, changes in our lifestyle, changes in our culture. But today, cold grass, pot, and crack refer to drugs that are destroying the lives of so many of our youth and adults. But today, AIDS is a horrible disease in which there is no cure. But today, a closet is something that homosexuals use when they want to go public with their chosen lifestyle. But today, a sugar daddy is someone that pays the rent for light bills and phone bills and gas bills in return for sex. But today, a strawberry is a young girl, and you'll see them in the inner city of New Orleans, standing on street corners who perform any kind of sexual favor for drugs. But today, a dog is a name that young brothers refer to themselves when they want to be cool. What's up, dog? Hey, dog. What happened, dog? Hey, bro. How you doing, dog? But for today, a scrub is a brother who pretends to be something that he's not, but he's really not anything, so he's really not getting any love. Do you pastor understand that also? And finally today, back that thing up, refers to a young uh, a group here in the city of New Orleans by the name of Juvenile. They sold millions and millions and millions of records. And it refers to a young lady who's rapidly shaking her gluteus maximus and said, that, 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 back that thing up. Just the you pastors will get that. My friend, things have changed because Satan is real. My friend, the occult reminds us that he's real. Witchcraft reminds us that he's real. Astrology reminds us that he's real. Palm readers reminds us that he's real. Movies that glorify satanic themes remind us that the devil is real. Rock and gangster rap music that encourages our young people to rebel against authority and rebel against mom and dad and to use all kind of profanity and other kind of things remind us that the devil is real. Sister, some of your dates remind you that the devil is real. Brother, some of your dates remind you that the devil is real. Professor, some of your students remind you that the devil is real. Pastor, some of your deacons remind you that the devil is real. He's real and he's in our society. Oh, my friend, he's in our families. He's in our schools. He's in our government. He's in our neighborhoods. He's in our, ch and yes, he's even in our churches. And if you got to beware, you got to know his tactics. I'm trying to remind the story of this, uh, 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 the time this ch church was having church service, and, and this guy came in dressed up like we think the devil looks. He had on this red outfit and the pitchfork and the horns, and, and everybody looked at us, oh, no, it's the devil. Everybody began running and scattering and, and excited and, and afraid because this man who they thought was the devil was walking in church. And there was an elderly man who was sitting up like on the second, on the first row, up here on the front, key somewhere where you're sitting at. And he just wouldn't move. He just had his forward, just looked behind everybody, and he just never moved. Everybody, oh, it's the devil, oh, it's the devil, oh, it's the devil, oh, he's going to get us. And that man just sat up there and just didn't move. After a while, this devil came up to me and said, sir, don't, don't you know who I am? I said, yeah, I know who you are. I said, don't you see all these folk running and scared? He said, yeah, I see them. I said, you're not afraid of me? He said, so I'm not afraid. He said, why are you not afraid of me? He said, I've been married to your sister for 28 years. Now, husbands who are here with your wives, don't laugh too loud at that one. He's real. 
and he's in our society. But I've come to expose him today. You see, my friend, Satan don't like me for exposing like this, but I don't care. Now, my friend, he is in our society. One of our young people asked me one time when I was doing a, a lesson, a series of Bible study lessons on spiritual warfare. They said, Pastor, if God created everything that was good, where in the world did evil come from? When I read the Bible in Genesis 1 and 2, I see that everything God created was good. And that's a good question. It's an honest question. It's a legitimate question and a question that deserves an answer. And I told our young friend, the Bible said that God created, uh, uh, not, not a, uh, uh, the devil, but he created an angel by the name of Lucifer. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 and 15 tell that Satan was an angel created by God. His name was Lucifer. He was created as an angel of God to cover the majesty of the throne of God. But then foolish pride, sinful pride entered into Lucifer's life and he rebelled against God. God did not create Satan as an evil being. God created an angel by the name of Lucifer who then rebelled against God and he became God's enemy. Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 to 14 tells us that Satan's sin was P-R-I-D-E egotistical pride, selfish ambition came into Satan's heart. He wasn't content on being the H-A-I-C, the head angel in charge. Some of y'all going to get that when you leave out. He wanted to be God. But I said, no, Satan, heaven's not big enough for both of us. One of us got to go. And Satan was kicked out of heaven. Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 17 describes what happened. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted by reason of wisdom and brightness. I will cast thee into the ground. Even Jesus reminisced, my brothers and my sisters, about what happened there in heaven. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 18, when he said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from the sky. And he was cast out of heaven. And he was so influential, Dr. Ken, that he influence over one third of all the other angels in heaven. And right now they're demon spirits upon this earth. And when Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 gave in to the tempting tactics of the enemy, when Adam and Eve listened to the devil instead of listening to God, when Adam and Eve said yes to Satan instead of saying yes to God, evil reigned again on this earth. So my brothers and my sisters, he's here but he comes in various forms. So in order to expose him, my brothers and my sisters, I must warn you that he uses various aliases. But the Bible does not want you and I to be ignorant of the tactics and the areas of the enemy. The Bible tells us how he tries to come. First Peter 5 and 8 say he's also known as the adversary. Second Corinthians 4 and 4 he says he's known as the God of this world. Ephesians 2 and 2 say he's known as the prince of the power of the air. Revelation 12 and 10 say he's known as the accuser of the brethren. Matthew 13 and 9 say he's known as the enemy. Mark 4 and 3 say he's known as the tempter. First Peter 5 and 8 say he's known as a roaring lion. John 8 and 44 say he's known as the father of lies and a murderer. Revelation 12 and 9 say he's known as a deceiver. But guess what, brothers? Guess what, sisters? He doesn't stop there. He comes in various ways. But I've come this morning at this 10 o'clock service to expose him tonight. But you see, my brothers and my sisters, I know the devil doesn't like me for exposing him like this, but guess what? I don't like him either. I don't like what he's doing to our churches. I don't like what he's doing to our youth. I don't like what he's doing to marriages. I don't like what he's doing to family. I don't like him either. So I've come to expose him today as the enemy of mankind. Oh, if you want to be able to be victorious in your walk and in your ministry, you've got to be aware of the presence of Satan in this world. But not only the presence of Satan in this world, the second thing I want you to see real quickly, you've got to also be aware of the program of Satan in this world. Not only his presence, but also, Dr. Strong, also, Dr. Paul, you got to be aware of the program of Satan in this world. And Satan's program, students, are twofold. The devil, the Bible says in our text, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Even not only just Satan present in this world, but God and he also has a program. And Satan's program is twofold. The first part of Satan's program is that Satan wants to keep the lost spiritually bounded. In other words, he wants to keep the lost, lost. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world, which is Satan, had blinded the minds of them which believe not. Think about those of you who are in evangelistic ministry. When you go out on the street corners or in the French quarters or come here for Mardi Gras and try to share the gospel or any day of the week, I mean, people will spit in your face, they'll lie to you, they'll throw the track on the ground. They don't realize that they're falling right into Satan's trap. And that is, Satan wants to keep the lost spiritually bounded. My friend, think about it. Think about uh, 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 believers and uh, family members who are lost, loved ones 
members who are lost, church members who are lost, neighbors who are lost. Think about how long you've been praying for that lost family member. How long you've been praying for that lost coworker. How long you've been praying for that lost friend. How long you've been praying for that lost relative. It's not that they can't do any better. They can. It's not that they don't know any better. They do. My friend, you've got to realize and understand they're falling right into Satan's trap. And Satan's trap is that he wants to keep the lost lost. He wants to keep them spiritually blind. But not only does he want to keep the lost lost, the second part of Satan's program is maybe he wants to keep the saved from living saved. Hello. Not only does he want to keep the lost lost, but secondly, he wants to keep the saved from living saved. In other words, Satan wants you to accept Christ but still compromise. He wants you to get saved but still sell out. He wants you to get born again but still behave like the world. He wants preachers to be promiscuous. He wants deacons to be devilish. He wants trustees to be tricky. He wants choir members to be cranky. He wants uh, uh, members to be messy. He wants students to be sinful. Oh, my brothers and my sisters. Satan wants you to think that holiness was just for Hezekiah, that sanctification was just for Samuel, that propitiation was just for Paul, that redemption was just for Ruth, that grace was just for Gideon, that justification was just for Joshua, that invitation was just for Isaiah, that kindness was just for Kelly, and forgiveness was just for Fred. But no! Sanctification is just not for uh, Samuel. It's for every child of God. Holiness is just not for Hezekiah. It's for every child of God. Redemption is just not for you, Ruth. Grace is just not for Gideon. Justification is just not for Joshua. Invitation is just not for Isaiah. Kindness is just not for Kelly. Forgiveness is just not for Fred. It's for every child of God. Oh, Satan, I've come to expose you today as the enemy of God's people. I know he's attacking our churches, but we can stop this mess. I know he's attacking our ministers, but we can stop this mess. I know he's attacking our children, but we can stop this mess. I know he's attacking our teenagers, but we can stop this mess. I know he's attacking the body of Christ, but we can stop this mess. We can stop this mess by developing a Popeye's mentality. Put ourselves up out of bootstraps. Put ourselves out of sin. Look the enemy in the eye and say, Satan, that's it. I've taken all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. No more messing with my mind. No more messing with my family. No more messing with my finances. No more messing with my thoughts. No more messing with my body. I am somebody. I'm a child of the king. I'm a chosen generation. I'm a royal priesthood. I am. I am. I am somebody. Satan, you are a defeated enemy, but like Popeye against Brutus, I've been trying to fight you on my own strength. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, it's time for us to eat our spiritual spinach. If you're tired of being beat up by the enemy, if you're tired of being set up by the enemy, it's time to eat your spiritual spinach. It's time to repent. It's time to get revived. It's time to get restored. It's time to get renewed. It's time for the redeemed of the Lord to say so. If he redeemed you, you ought to say so. If he set you free, you ought to say so. If he delivered you, you ought to say so. Oh, my friend, in order to believe what the devil has done, the Bible says you've got to recognize the program of Satan in this world. But then there's one more thing. My time is running out. I'll give you the rest the next time I come back. The presence of Satan in this world. The program of Satan in this world. And then there's the third thing, the power of the believer to resist Satan. The power of the believer to resist Satan. My friend, the believer should always be ready, always be on God. Our text says, be sober, be not drunk, be, be vigilant, be on the alert. Why? Because you're the devil, the adversary, as a roaring lion, walking about Sheila, seeking uh, whom he may devour. My friend, not only should we always be ready, but you and I as God's people, as men and women of Christ, we should always take a stand against the enemy. James 4 and 7 says, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. My friend, we as believers have to learn how to stand against the enemy. We've got to sharpen our skills in the area of spiritual warfare. We must put on the spiritual armor that Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. The helmet 
of salvation, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteous, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Oh, my friend, we as believers, if we're going to be victorious against our enemy, we must recognize the power of the believer. First John 4 and 4 say, you are God, little children, and have overcome them. Why? Because greater is he that's in you and you and you than he that is in the world. Paul said we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ that loved us. Oh, my friend, Satan won't tell you this, but I have come to expose him today. God has given the church power. God has given you power. God has given me power. Power to walk right. Power to talk right. Power to preach right. Power to live right. Power to sing right. Power to serve right. God has given us power. Oh, the enemy is Satan. I've come to expose you today. In every area you would try to attack these students. In every area where you would try to attack this campus. In every area where you try to attack these teachers. Because we've taken all we can stand uh, and we can't stand uh, no more. Satan, I declare and decree before God, angels, and this assembly to expose you as the enemy of God's people. And I furthermore declare that from this moment on, that everybody under the sound of my voice, everybody in this chapel, everybody listening by tape or over the internet, will be able to live for God, will be able to live for God, will be able to stand and be victorious in this life. Satan, we are exposing you for every area and everything you try to attack. This congregation, this body of Christ, these seminary students, for these campus, for this campus, for these students, for these professors, for everyone under the sign of my voice. I am letting you know that you have power as believers to stand against the enemy. Power over abortion. Power over adultery. Power over alcoholism. Power over bad habits. I decree it, Satan, in Jesus' name. Power over bitterness. Power over child abuse. Power over coach. Power over church mess. Power over depression. Power over divorce. I decree it, Satan, in Jesus' name. Power over pride. Power over drug abuse. Power over envy. Power over fear. Power over gambling. I decree it, Satan, in Jesus' name. Power over rock and gangster rap music. Power over homosexuality. Power over gambling. Power over incest. Power over loneliness. Power over mental illness. Power over the occult. Power over false doctrines. I decree it, Satan, in Jesus' name. Power over sexual immorality. Power over suicide. Power over teenage pregnancy. Power over violence on this school campus. I decree it, Satan, in Jesus' name. Because we're taking all we can stand, and we can't stand no more. No more. No more. We're taking our families back. We're taking our men back. We're taking our women back. We're taking our teenagers back. We're taking our students back. We're taking our churches back because we're taking all we can stand uh, and we can't stand no more. Say that we expose you as a liar. We expose you as a deceiver. We expose you as a murderer. We expose you as the enemy. We recognize your presence. We recognize your program. But we also recognize the power that God has given to the people of God. It won't be easy, but you can do it. It won't be a cakewalk, but you can do it. You can live a, a victorious life, even here in the city of New Orleans. But you got to have that Popeye's mentality. That's it. I've taken all I can stand, uh, and I can't stand uh, no more. Church, it's time to get right. Brothers, it's time to get right. Sisters, it's time to get right. The old folks used to sing a song that said, Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go home. Satan, you've been building your kingdom all over this world. It's time for the people of God to realize the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Dr. Kim, the songwriter said, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind me. Why? Because victory today is mine. You can have victory. You can have victory. And you can have victory. But you've got to develop a Popeye mentality. That's it. I've taken all I can stand. And I can't stand no more. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may be bow. But you and I have the victory. God bless you. And may God keep you as you go in ministry.
Heavenly Father, we pray that You would forgive us for waiting so long to turn to You in the midst of the battle. Give us strength to match our opposition. Give us courage to match our challenges. And Father, You have put us in a city that could well be described as the seat of Satan. May Your presence in our lives so overwhelm the evil of this place that New Orleans becomes known as the throne of Jesus. It is in your wondrous name that we pray. Amen and amen.